Naya Shaka is the valedictorian of the Levita High School class of 2020. Naya is a born leader and has enthusiastically excelled in academics and athletics. She is always smiling and is a friend to all. This year, Naya was named the Division I Volleyball Player of the Year and the league MVP. She has served as student body president, class president, president of the National Honor Society. She also was awarded the volleyball scholarship to Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. She is looking forward to a career as a biologist. Dear Kachera Chapel members, my name is Naya Shaka and I'm a graduate from Levita High School. I've been fortunate enough to be a recipient of the generous Kachera Chapel Scholarship. I'd like to thank the Kachera Chapel Congregation for awarding me with a $1,500 scholarship. Your gifted dollars go a long way with helping me to continue my education beyond high school. As you all know, education is very expensive these days, so every dollar helps. I graduated this year at the top of my class, consisting of 17 strong young ladies. During my time at La Vida leading up to graduation, I enjoyed a very successful high school volleyball career. I mention this because volleyball played a big role in deciding what college I wanted to attend. After weighing my options and considering schools that fit both my academic program interests and athletic interests, I decided to attend Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Go Skyhawks! <laughs> So this fall, depending on the plans that COVID-19 has for all of us, hopefully I will be, I will be headed to Durango mid-August to start working out with my volleyball team. Once my class starts, I plan to begin the pursuit of obtaining a bachelor's degree in biology. My long-term goal is to take this biology degree and eventually have a career in marine biology. Of course, my number one goal is obtaining a quality education but I also hope that my overall college experience provides me with a very diverse social exposure beyond what I am accustomed to here in La Vida. I am excited to see what the future holds. I would like to say that your kind donations are providing students from La Vida High School with amazing opportunities. I can only speak for myself and my brother who received this scholarship before me and successfully graduated from CSU Fort Collins with a degree in biology that students with this scholarship have a high degree of success. We are going out from this small school of Levita and making the Kachera Chapel congregation proud. Once again, I am sincerely grateful for the Kachera Chapel scholarship. Thank you, Naishaka. Welcome. Welcome, my Kachara and Levita neighbors or anyone else who might be joining this broadcast. Uh, I'm really glad you're here with me. My name is Jim Tucker. I'm a retired Episcopal priest. I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. My wife, Jenny, and I uh, have owned a cabin for many, many years up on Lubbock or Texas Hill, which is right across from downtown Kuchara. And uh, this is the first time in over 30 years that we are not going to be in Kuchara in the summer. Uh, between COVID-19 uh, a long, long, long drive from North Carolina with a, uh, an old sick dog. And my wife's changed schedule at the University of North Carolina Medical School. We are going to stay here this year. This service is being held in my home church uh, in Chapel Hill, uh, the Chapel of the Cross. Uh, this is where I volunteer uh, my time as a priest associate. Uh, and this chapel, this building was built in 1848, so it's seen a lot of history. And I'm grateful uh, to be able to join you today and share our worship. Uh, and I wanna thank especially Eileen Ramsey for all the hard work she's done this summer putting these services together. They're hard enough to film, much less edit. And for Justin Tull, who's put together all the preachers and the service music and whatnot, and for those who will provide the special music and the hymn, welcome. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we ever, wherever we find ourselves, we are bound together by you. Today, as we share scripture and prayers for ourselves and on behalf of others, 
We ask you to be in our midst, to open our hearts to you and to one another. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn this morning is Fairest Lord Jesus. or aloud those people and those things you want to pray for let us pray for the peace of the world for the unity of all peoples let us pray to the Lord for the president and Congress for our governors and mayors for all our local leaders for the leaders of the nations and for all in authority let us pray to the Lord. For this town of Kuchara, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. For seasonable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. For the good earth which God has given us, especially in this valley, and for the wisdom and the will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. For those who travel on land, on water, or in the air, let us pray to the Lord. For the aged and the infirm, especially those in nursing homes, for the widowed and orphans, for the sick and suffering, especially remembering those affected by COVID-19 and those we remember today in our prayers. Let us pray to the Lord. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed, all those forced out of work because of this pandemic, and for the destitute, for prisoners and captives, for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For all who've died in the hope of the resurrection and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. 
for the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord that we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach. Let us pray to the Lord. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. And now let us sum up all our prayers by saying together the words that Jesus taught his first disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them prophets are dead and gone. Put your hands upon that plow, oh God, hold on. representing the beginning of a new church year. The first lesson I'll use is from Isaiah, the 64th chapter. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so the mountains would quake at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. Here is the reading. My second lesson is from the Gospel of Mark. Therefore keep awake. You do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Here ends the reading. We all do a lot of waiting in our lives. We wait for trivial and important things. We wait for lights to change, for toast to pop up. We wait for people not wearing masks at the grocery store to move away. 
or we wait to see if we can find toilet paper or Clorox wipes. We wait for appointments. We wait for church to begin. We wait for our wife to cut our hair with electric clippers because we can't go to the barber. We wait for fish to bite. We wait for the first real cold snap in the fall. For computer programs to boot up. And in bigger ways we wait. I once waited twice for nine months for my children to be born. Though my wife reminds me that her waiting was a lot harder than mine. As a minister, I wait with people to hear what a pathology report gives us, tells us. I wait with a family to see if a teenager come home, comes home. I wait till nurses have detached hoses and lines from someone's body so I can go into the room with the family to pray for the person they love. I wait with nervous grooms in those seemingly endless moments before the wedding music begins. And it's obvious that most of our lives are about waiting. Waiting to begin, waiting to quit, waiting for news, waiting for comfort, waiting for closure, waiting. All this has never seemed so intense to me as in the last four and a half months. We've been as a, a sort of state of suspended animation. Uh, as a friend of mine told me the other day, we've been lurching from meal to meal, zooming, learning to zoom with our friends and families, watching grandchildren grow up on computer screens. And it's clear to me that waiting is simply a given, like breathing. It's not waiting you have control over. But maybe we have some control over how we wait. So I'm going to call this sermon, since I was asked for a title, Learning How to Wait. And since I'm a Christian, I will subtitle it, Learning to Wait for God. The readings I chose from Isaiah and from Mark are about waiting for God. St. Paul says in his letter to the church folk in Corinth, that we are all waiting for faith, hope, and love, but most especially for love. He said that God's love can survive all things, withstand any corrosion of life. That love hopes for all things and endures all things and never ends. But Paul also said that in this life, we try and understand and know this love but it's like trying to see our own face in a poorly lit mirror. It's hidden and unclear. Yet the promise is given by Jesus that one day we will see and we will know fully face to face and we will understand completely. But until then, you have to wait. And waiting can lose its sense of hope and expectancy and even its faith. It can become tedious and boring or it can become filled with anxiety and worry about things you cannot control. I do both. Sometimes I want to avoid all the news of the coronavirus updates, all the injustices which I see manifest around me in society. They overwhelm me and I escape by rereading books whose stories I know by heart because it puts me to sleep. Then sometimes I cannot look away from the news and I consume it like an addict. I can't stop till I'm so full of angst that I have no outlet for. Avoidance versus free-floating anxiety. I think that's the clinical description of depression. I think we're all depressed during this time. Neither of these responses to waiting is recommended by Jesus. Martha, Martha, he says to his friend, the sister of Mary and Lazarus, you're fretting and you're anxious about many things. Only one thing is needed. What is that one thing? In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells the crowd, don't be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or drink or what you shall wear. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor spin, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
about falling asleep, Jesus tells us, stay awake, watch. You do not know the time nor the moment when the master will come. And he tells the story of the 10 young bridal attendants uh, who are waiting to light the way for the bridegroom to the feast, but five of them fall asleep and their lamps run out of oil and they miss the moment the bridegroom comes. Sleepiness or anxiety, avoidance or agitation, is there no alternative when we wait, even during a pandemic? How do you wait for God in this life? Or for our own true love, which God has promised us? How do we wait and not tear ourselves apart or fall asleep and miss the crucial moment? In his book, The Shaking of the Foundations, the theologian Paul Tillich once remarked, that waiting means having and not ha having at the same time. We have faith, we have hope, but we still have to wait for God. Tillich says, I think of the theologian who doesn't wait for God because he or she thinks they already possess God enclosed in a doctrine. Or the Bible student who does not wait for God because he or she already possesses him enclosed in a book. Or the clergy person who does not wait for God because he or she possesses him enclosed in an institution. Or the believer who does not wait for God because he possesses him enclosed within his own or her own experience. Tillich's right. We don't wait for God. We create our own answers out of our boredom and our anxiety. I think of the ancient Israelites when Moses went up on the mountain to talk to God. They couldn't stand the waiting. So they made a golden statue of a bull out of all those golden bracelets and earrings that they stolen from the Egyptians and they worshiped it. It's not easy to wait, but to wait with a purpose, to wait for God, to not memorize all the answers could such waiting be a completely different thing? Could waiting be part of being a person of faith? Could waiting even be seen as holy? In this light, waiting is the opposite of falling asleep or being constantly upset. Could God be using our waiting to break into our lives? To get our attention and our normal pattern of waiting blocks him out. How can you hear if you're always falling asleep? How can you hear? How can you listen if you're so upset you can only hear your inner jangling? Can waiting be about infinitely more than killing time? Might it be the very prerequisite for hearing God's voice? There's a very ancient Jewish tradition at the Passover, the Seder dinner. At the center of the head table, a plate of food is left uneaten. A chair is left unused. The food in the chair for the prophet Elijah. Elijah is supposed to come to foretell the final coming of the Messiah. And there have been over 3,000 years of waiting for Elijah to show up. Are people anxious and depressed? Are they sleepy and, and avoiding? No, there's expectation in the room and hope remains for Elijah's presence. The hope and expectation is that Elijah will come to the Seder dinner every year. Isaiah said to God long ago in scripture, oh, that you would come down, that mountains would shake at your presence. For long ages, no one's heard, no one's Perceive, no eye has seen any God like you who works for those who wait for him. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah and has come and even now is in our midst, Emmanuel, God with us. And that beyond this world of waiting full of tedium and fear, there is a hope of true love. How can we not with joyful expectation, live the life that God has given us, even in the midst of trouble. Like a child waiting for Christmas, like a, a lover waiting for a loved one, 
Like a couple waiting for a promised child, our waiting is for wholeness, completeness, the promise, for God, for true love. And we live by the promise that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Waiting? Waiting is not just something to be endured. It is our special destiny. We must resist all those who create false gods out of boredom and a desire for entertainment. We must resist all those who create false gods out of fear and anxiety and prey upon it. Our eyes may not yet be strong enough to see him clearly at our side, but that doesn't mean he's not there. And all the waiting we do now is to try and learn how to see and hear it. All times are modern times. Everyone who's ever lived in the past, like us, has thought they lived on the very cutting edge of modernity. In spite of plague, earthquake, fire, and famine, and in our own day we would add COVID-19, racism, or climate change, if we are waiting for everything to go back to the way it used to be, it's not going to happen. Life after COVID-19 will be different because life does not stand still. The promise of God is dynamic, not static, ever. And whatever the change, God will be at our side. Next year, my friends, I hope we can see one another face to face. I hope and pray. Until then, be courageous. You wait for God. Amen. Let us pray. God, give us the strength and the wisdom to wait for you. Awaken us to those needs of body and soul, of loss and hope, of wound and healing, which we must cry out before you. Be that leaping grace, that generosity of spirit by which we care anew for what happens to the human race. Make us aware of the ache and anxiety in the world around us. Keep us open to cries for help. Let our prayer shape what we will do to mend, overcome, and make new. And now let us go forth into the world in peace. Let us be of good courage. Let us hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint heart. Support the weak. Lift up those who fall. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you all this day and forever. Amen.